You are listening to Blessed and Bossed Up, presented by Anchored Media, an entrepreneurship podcast for Christians all about how to make God the CEO of your business. Get ready to be inspired, challenged, but well-equipped to live and build your destiny his way. Hey guys, welcome to another episode of the Blessed and Bossed Up podcast and another installment of our Bible on Business series. Before we get started, I just want to say thank you, thank you, thank you, and thank you some more to all of you who send me messages who, I mean, I've gotten messages on Instagram, I've gotten emails on LinkedIn. Um, I just want to say thank you. Like I got a message that blessed me so much this week. Shout out to Karen from Oklahoma. She said that she runs a real estate team and she was saying that she teaches the podcast in her team meetings. And let me tell you that that just warmed my heart. As I told y'all before, when I'm recording these episodes, I'm talking to myself (laughs) and I hear these messages from the Lord. I prepare the notes for these shows and I put them out and I don't really know the impact beyond like analytics and stuff, but those are just numbers. I don't know the qualifiable impact. I just have that quantitative data. So to be able to hear that you guys are teaching this in your business settings, to hear people give me their feedback to, I mean, over the years, there have been so many examples, but for this series in particular, it has brought me personally so much joy to do. So just to hear that it is translating into your businesses and that you're then also able to multiply that to allow it to minister to people within your sphere of influence, it just It it makes my heart smile. So thank you. Please continue to leave reviews. If this show blessed you, reviews really help the show. Um, Please continue to send me messages. I just, I can't tell y'all enough how much I appreciate it. And I've been doing this show for seven and a half years. And for me to still be this fulfilled by it and so excited about it and excited to hear you guys' feedback is just, it is a blessing especially in this industry of podcasting that has grown so much and has been so watered down and so much foolishness for me to just really stand my ground in what the Lord has called me to do and be consistent in it and not conform or compromise because of what the trends are doing. I know how hard it is sometimes to fight through a lot of the internal stuff. So to be able to just see the impact and hear your stories on how to show impact, I just have to say thank you so much because it truly blesses me. I also have to say thank you to you guys who show up to the lives that I do on my YouTube channel. If you are not subscribed, I'll put the link to my YouTube channel. I go live as just as I kind of just process out loud and read and study through the scripture for each episode. I've been doing it the last couple of weeks. The first one was pre-recorded. The last one I did, it was live and it was fun. The people who joined, um, one of the women, she talked about like boundaries, like how you'll see where that fits in this episode in a moment. But she was talking about how we need boundaries as it relates to today's topic. And I said, you know what? That's perfect. That is going to be some of the practical points that we incorporate at the end, boundaries. And so it's cool to process out loud what the, the text says, process out loud the implications for what that means for us as entrepreneurs has been really cool. And I will continue to do it. So make sure you guys uh, subscribe to my YouTube channel. I don't have a specific day and time that I go live. It's more so of when I have that pocket of time to do so, I do it. Um, So make sure you're subscribed so you get that notification when I go live. Okay, last church announcement, and I'm very excited about this. I've created a resource for you guys called the Bible on Business Dashboard. This is a totally free resource. I wanted to create something that will help you study the text for yourself so that the Lord can reveal and allow you to pull business implications for your particular business. So in these episodes, I discuss the text. I give you some of my feedback and downloads and ideas and thoughts based upon the scripture and what I believe it could mean for us as entrepreneurs. But I want you to also do this for yourself because I believe as you do, the Lord will reveal to you 
particulars that can be extremely useful for your life and what he's called you to do. And so I created this dashboard where I will be able to house these business Bible study guides for each individual episode. So when you open this guide, you'll have the overview of the episode. It'll be a link to the audio for the episode there. It'll have the scripture that we're studying. So for example, the losing 83% episode is there and it'll have John 6, 60 through 71. There are resources listed there. So a study Bible, the concordance where you could study different words, other tools like the blue letter Bible, Bible gateway. And I've also included relevant scriptures for further study. So let's say you listen to the losing 83% episode and you were like, man, I really am struggling with people walking away, losing clients, losing followers. You can use this as a guide to study that text, but I've also given you re- relevant scriptures for further study. So you can dive deeper beyond what we may have talked about in the podcast in your own time. I even give you steps to how you can truly pull from the text. So with each step, there's an action, there is a reflection, There are journal prompts, questions for you to ask of the Lord and for you to ask yourself as you are exploring the text. There are practical ways that you can apply. I'll give you some ideas of how you can apply in your business, what you may have learned through the episode or through your study. And it's just, in my opinion, a thorough foundation and a thorough resource that you can use to study the Bible for your particular business. So in this dashboard, if you click the link in the show notes, again, it's free. I don't want you guys to pay for this at all. I just really wanted to give you something so that you aren't just taking my word for it, that you're really studying it for yourself. And in this dashboard, I'm going to update it for each individual episode. At the time of me recording this podcast, because I have to go back and do it from when we first started the series on the shepherding episode. So, so far, there's only the losing 83% episode, the business financial relief episode, and then there it will be this episode um, here once this comes out. And then over the next week or two, I'm going to be updating it with the previous episodes. But I want to make sure that you guys got this ASAP. So if you click the link in the show notes, you can download the Bible on Business dashboard. You only have to download it once. I didn't want it to be something where every week you got to enter your name and your email. No, you only got to download it once. You will be sent the link and then just check it periodically and you'll be able to see new episodes populate. It's my goal that by the time an episode is released, you'll also have the Bible on Business study guide for that episode. But I'm still working through updating it for the episodes that we've done earlier on in the series. So I pray that you're as excited about it as I am and that you download it and that you utilize it. I worked really hard on it and I do believe that it is going to bless your business and keep me updated on how you feel about it, how it's useful to you and how I can improve upon it. It's my first time doing this. And so I want to make sure that it is something that is very useful for you all. But again, it's free. It's my gift to you because I just want you to study the word for your business. And I want to celebrate what the Lord does with you and your business. So that's it for the church announcements. These were a little long today. (laughs) I usually like to keep my church announcements short, but I didn't want to skimp out on saying thank you. I didn't want to skimp out on discussing my appreciation for those of you guys who joined me live. And I definitely didn't want to skimp out on this awesome resource that I believe is going to bless you guys. All right, let's hop into today's episode. Today's Bible on Business episode is titled How to Be Both Content and Ambitious. Now, let me tell you, contentment is something that me and the Lord have been working on for quite some time. I have always been an ambitious and high achieving person. The root of that, I've worked out through therapy and deliverance and growing in Christ. The root of that was definitely trauma for the majority of my life. I found a lot of my value and achievements. I felt like I was more loved and respected and people showed up for me when I accomplished something. I didn't see a lot of value in myself as a human being. 
I saw myself as having value as a human doing, a human accomplishing, a human accumulating. And again, thank God for therapy and for deliverance and for me finding my identity in Christ because I no longer have that issue. But even though the Lord has delivered me from that, I'm still an ambitious person. And so when the Lord had me personally studying on contentment, I was really struggling with trying to figure out, well, where does my ambition fit? Because I see in the text so many warnings against selfish ambition. And because selfish is in front of ambition, that let me know that ambition itself isn't bad. It's more so of when it becomes selfish that it is an issue. So I understood that my ambition was okay, but I just practically didn't really, I couldn't conceptualize so that I could apply how to maintain my ambition, ambitious nature while also being content. And so I'm excited about this episode because it is an, a, a byproduct of personal study, personal transformation. And I believe that it will be freeing for many of you as well so that you can know that your desire for more, your desire to grow, your desire to build these businesses, your desire to build wealth isn't inherently wrong, but it has to be tempered. It has to be managed so that you don't fall into the selfish ambition, so that you do maintain contentment. Because the Lord wants us to to live and operate and build our businesses from a content place. And I feel like many of us would want that as well. Like we don't want to be stressed about what's next. We don't want to be um, just constantly in turmoil because we're going after more. I think most of us want to be content, but it's the how. (laughs) that can be tough. And that's what we're going to explore in this episode, because I want us as we build these businesses, as we go after the things that the Lord has for us, we do so in a way to where our priorities are in check and we are safeguarded from the ways in which the enemy will manipulate us as entrepreneurs to build and go after whatever outside of the will of God. So for this episode, we have two texts, and we're honestly going to go to a few places in the text. But our main scriptures for these this episode is Philippians 4, 11 through 13, and 1 Timothy 6, 6 through 11. Let's start with Philippians 4, 11 through 13, and I'm going to read it out of the English Standard Version. Now, to give a little context, Paul, he wrote this letter to the church in Philippi while he was uh, incarcerated, which was most likely in Rome. The themes of this letter are joy, encouragement and gratitude. Paul was pretty close with the Philippian church because they had supported him financially and also by praying for him. This passage in particular, it teaches about being sufficient in Christ, and it also talks about how true contentment and strength don't come from external circumstances, but they come from a deep abiding relationship with Jesus. Now let's read the text again, Philippians 4, 11 through 13. It says, not that I am speaking of being in need for I have learned in whatever situation I am to be content. I know how to be brought low and I know how to abound in any and every circumstance. I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger abundance and need. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. And you know that Paul wasn't just blowing smoke because he was in jail as he wrote this. So he wasn't writing this from the palace. This man was locked up and still content. So going to our second scripture, and then we'll discuss them both together. First Timothy 6, 6 through 11. So context for this one, this is Paul again, and he's writing this letter to Timothy, who's like his protege, like his spiritual son. And Timothy was leading the church in Ephesus. This letter addresses the issues related to church leadership. We see a lot about false teaching in here and how Christians should live. The passage that we're going to read, it specifically deals with contentment, wealth, and the dangers of desiring riches. It warns about the spiritual dangers that are associated with the pursuit of wealth, and it emphasizes the importance of pursuing righteousness. 
So again, 1 Timothy 6, 6 through 11, English Standard Version. It says, but godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into the world and we cannot take anything out of the world. But if we have food and clothing with these, we will be content. But those who desire to be rich fall into temptation, into a snare, into many senseless and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. It is through this craving that some have wandered away. I love that word craving. It is through this craving that some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many many pangs. But as for you, O man of God, flee these things. Pursue righteousness, godliness faith, love, steadfastness, gentleness. Now, it is extremely important for us to discuss this, and I'm going to really take my time with this episode because this text is part of the reason why this series is happening. So many people, they crave wealth, they crave riches, so much so at the expense of of their own spiritual well-being, we see this play out so many times. We see this play out in the church. We see this play out in the business world. We see this play out even with the extent of the way that this whole Christian entrepreneurship industry has grown. We see it play out in a way that people articulate scripture to entrepreneurs, where everything is about how God wants to bless our businesses and not how we need to make our businesses fit the will and the way of the Lord. All of it is about what we need to do to become six figure business owners or what we need to do to become millionaires and all of that and how God is going to pour us out blessings and all of these things. And at worst, it's perverted and false teaching. At best, it's incomplete. And so if you do not study any other scripture that we talk about in this Bible on business series, I need you to study these because these are going to allow you to safeguard yourself your flesh, and your own ambition so that you don't get sucked into the ways of this business world. We don't do business the world's way. We do business God's way. Our measures of success are not in income, is not in the accumulation of material things. It is in our ability to accurately obey the will and the instruction of the Lord. It is in our ability to be godly, to be Christ-like, to be submitted to the Holy Spirit. Those are our measurements of success. None of this other stuff. But again, as an entrepreneur, we know we have to be mindful of the metrics, but we are not moved by the metrics. We are moved by the Spirit. And it's not enough to just say that because our flesh is going to crave riches. As business owners, we're going to have goals to thrive financially because we want our businesses to be successful. So we're working towards something that could potentially pervert us if we're not careful. And the way in which we stay grounded and we stay anchored and we don't get swept away by that and our ambition isn't tainted is by making sure that we are grounded in contentment. This episode is brought to you by NetSuite. Let's do some math real quick. The less your business spends on operations, on multiple systems, on delivering your product or service, the less you spend, the more margin that you have, which means the more money that you keep. NetSuite is the number one cloud financial system, bringing accounting, financial management, inventory, HR into one platform and one source of truth. With NetSuite, you reduce IT costs because NetSuite lives in the cloud with no hardware required and is accessed from anywhere. You cut the cost of maintaining multiple systems because you've got one unified business management suite. You improve efficiency by bringing all your major business processes into one platform, slashing manual tasks and errors. Over 37,000 companies have already made the move. So do the math. See how you'll profit with NetSuite. Y'all, I can attest that everything out here is expensive. All of these tools and these AI softwares and systems that we love, they cost and those costs add up. And it's important for us, especially in this economy, to find creative ways to cut costs and boost performance at the same time. By popular demand, NetSuite has extended its one-of-a-kind flexible financing program for a few more weeks. Head to netsuite.com slash blessed, netsuite.com slash blessed, netsuite.com slash blessed. 
So contentment in the Greek is a word, and I'm going to butcher this, but I'm going to try my best. Atarchia, it refers to a state of self-sufficiency, satisfaction, and peace, regardless of external circumstances. It is an inner sense of satisfaction and sufficiency that comes from trusting in God's provision. The Greek word comes from autos, which means self, and archaeo, which means to be sufficient, to be satisfied. It literally means self-sufficiency or having enough within oneself. However, in a Christian context, this self-sufficiency is understood as being rooted, rooted in reliance on God rather than us. Contentment contrasts with covetousness and greed, which stem from a lack of trust in God's provision. Contentment allows a person to live peacefully and joyfully, regardless of material wealth, social status, or external conditions. It is a key to spiritual stability and satisfaction, as it is rooted in the confidence that God will supply all of our needs according to his riches and glory. And I know those are a lot of words, but let me paint a picture for you. Imagine you woke up one day. We are in another recession economically. Your mortgage is going up. Business is a little slow. You're not really seeing the numbers that you saw in previous seasons. Your your money has gotten a little tight. You got excess income. Something happens and that just truly puts your business in a deficit. You got the bills on the table. Got the calculator, the old school calculator calculator, not the one on your phone. And you're trying to make the math work. You got to pull from here, delay this in order to make it happen. In the midst of all of this that's going on, though, you got a smile on your face. You have joy in your heart. You have a peace and a settledness that is unfathomable based upon the circumstances that are going on right now. You have a level of confidence in knowing that the Lord will provide. You're excited to see exactly how he's going to do this because you have no clue all you see is red and your account your flesh may want to see red in anger all you have is these phone calls coming in of people saying that you owe them money you get in letters in the mail but you still got peace you still have contentment you have a joy that's unexplainable because again it's like it's almost like watching a movie and you're waiting for the the plot to develop and you're waiting for that hero, which is the Lord, to come in. And you just want to see how he's going to do it. You're not stressed. You sleeping good at night. You watching your kids play and loving the smile on their face, even though they have no idea that they're going to eat peanut butter and jelly tonight because that's all you can afford. But you're OK with it because you're comfortable and confident in knowing that the Lord is going to provide. You're OK with answering the phone. You're not even ignoring the bill collector's call. You're just telling them what you have, the facts of the situation. And when you hang up, you still have peace because you know the Lord is going to figure it out. Can you imagine that? I mean, I'm sure we can all identify with the circumstances because the state of, especially in America, the state of our economy and inflation and everything right now is wild. So I'm sure we can, and for many of us, identify with the circumstances. But can you imagine having that internal position, that internal rest, your nerves not being bad, anxiety not even being a thing, you losing sleep, not even being like you rest well. You wake up rejuvenated. You ain't got headaches when you wake up. You know, your shoulders ain't tight. You relaxed. Can you imagine having that type of disposition in the midst of what looks like devastation? I feel like for the majority of my life, I couldn't understand that. I couldn't wrap my mind around not having anxiety around circumstances around. I couldn't wrap my mind around not waking up with a headache because all I could do is think about like my body may have been asleep, but my mind couldn't get turned off. Like I couldn't wrap my mind around how Paul could have this disposition. But in the Lord working, using this text to work through me, over the last year and some change, as time has gone on, I found myself with this level of contentment where things will still come up in business. I remember recently this something came up with the studio and I was like, Lord, this your business. And I put my phone down like I got a call or something, but it, wherever the notification was, it was on my phone. And I was with my son playing with him, my baby boy, who's with me during the day. 
And I put my phone down. I said, God, this is your business. Now, Tatum, a year plus ago, would have got that laptop, brought it into the playroom, let my son do some free play and figured out how to solve that financial problem. Tatum in 2024? No, 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 no. No, absolutely not. I'm not going to let the enemy suck me back into what God has already delivered me from. So, God, this is your business. I'm cutting my, I'm locking my screen, putting my phone down, and I'm going to continue to read these stories to my child. When I tell y'all, maybe a couple of weeks later, the problem was solved and I didn't have to do anything. The Lord did exactly what he does, which is provide. And that was just another, oh, t- let me write this down. This is going in God's track record because I keep lists. <laughs> I keep lists because the enemy is not going to try to play me to think that I'm not going to remember what God has done because it's in those testimonies. It's in these these uh, points that I put on God's clock for in my life that helped me to be able to face the next obstacle. And so I was like, man, God, you are good. I praised him. I put it down in my answered prayers notes and then we moved on. But my response, I feel like our reactions to circumstances reveal a lot about who we really are. And so I was proud of myself because, again, old Tatum wouldn't have responded to that in that way. And I feel like a way that you could really tell if you delivered by something is how you respond the next time that you're tempted. And I was tempted to go back into old ways, but I decided to continue on in the way that the Lord had been changing and growing me. And I did. And then I saw the result of that, which is him being him and providing. So contentment is something that I want y'all to study because I promise you, you will be less anxious, less stressed. Your blood pressure will be normal. You won't be having all these cortisol issues and things that are going on, but you'll be able to truly operate in the joy of the Lord. You'll be able to have a new level of fulfillment in your business. You'll be able to approach what you have to do with the level of excitement versus from a place of anger and pressure and tension. I'm trying to free you from being subject to um, being subject emotionally to the ebbs and flows of business because that is a reality of this entrepreneurship life. Things are going to be up, things are going to be down. Of course, we could put things in place where we have a little bit more predictability, but the economy will change. A pandemic will happen. There's so many different things that will interrupt or impact our businesses, but we should be operating them from a place of contentment. There's also seasons and temptations to where you may have excess, where you may get that million dollar revenue. You may get this huge contract. You may have clients and customers coming from the woodwork and money ain't a thing (laughs) for you anymore, but that'll leave you vulnerable to the plans of the enemy too. So again, the This contentment episode is for us to establish an anchor, for us to establish some groundedness, and for us to put boundaries in place to protect that contentment. So as I was wrestling with this text, and as the Lord has been taking me through this process and teaching me through contentment, something that I struggled with and this question that I asked was, God, where does my ambition fit? Because like I said earlier, the Bible is clear on the the issues with selfish ambition, but how do I remain a content person and be an ambitious person? Because in my mind, it, it contentment almost felt like I was sitting on my hands and it almost felt like, well, if I go after something new, then that means that I'm not content. So it was a little confusing as far as how to operate in that healthy middle. So the first thing I want to do is really like look up ambition and then contrast that with selfish ambition. Ambition is defined simply as the desire to achieve a particular end. That's it. Nothing more, nothing less. So our ambition to start a business, start a ministry, achieve a certain financial dollar amount in our business, buy a house, whatever your goal is, There's nothing wrong with having an area that you're working towards, but selfish ambition is where things become an issue. When we look at the definition of selfish ambition, selfish ambition is ambition that is driven by self-centered motives, such as the desire for personal gain, power, status, or recognition, 
often at the expense of others. It is ambition that is not aligned with godly values and leads to actions that are self-serving rather than serving others. The primary motivation behind selfish ambition is self-promotion and the pursuit of personal desires without regard for the impact on others. It is often fueled by pride, envy, or a desire for control and dominance. Selfish ambition tends to have a negative impact on others. It can lead to competition, rivalry, manipulation, and the exploitation of others for personal gain. Relationships may suffer. Ethical boundaries may be crossed in the pursuit of selfish goals. This is contradictory to God's will. Selfish ambition is often in direct contradiction to God's will as it prioritizes your personal desires over God's purposes and the well-being of others. It can lead to actions that are unethical, harmful, and divisive, and it will ultimately detract from one's relationship with God and others. Selfish ambition can present itself in so many different ways. When it comes to business, if you have somebody where they know that their particular product is harmful to customers, but they want to ignore that because they want to keep their profit margin small and make more money, that is selfish ambition. A lot of these jobs that y'all work at where you can't take time off, where you can't have a life outside of work, that's selfish ambition because the company wants to see them grow more than they want you to be well and have some type of work-life harmony going on. Even philanthropically, a lot of companies will donate money, not for the sake of the charity, but for the sake of the tax write-off. So we see selfish ambition present itself in so many different ways. Here are some other key differences. So with regular motivation, usually you're motivated by a desire to achieve some meaningful goals and contribute to the well-being of others or fulfill a calling or purpose. When your ambition is selfish, you're motivated by self-centered desires. So personal gain, power, status, recognition, forget everybody else. I'm trying to get ahead. So even within your own ambition, something that I would ask you to ask yourself and reflect on when you make certain business decisions is why am I doing this? Can I be honest with y'all? Can I be very transparent? I have made decisions in my business over the years, both from a selfish, ambitious place and from just a regular ambitious place. My selfish, ambitious decisions had way more dire consequences. And to be quite frank, Money-wise, impact-wise, my pure ambitious decisions were way more lucrative than the ones I made out of selfishness. The most successful things that I've done have been a result of pure ambition. The flops that I've done have been from selfish ambition. And when I tell you I thank God that he loves me so much and that he gives me so much grace and mercy that my selfish ambitions uh, my my decisions made in selfish ambition didn't ruin me. And at each time, because I've made more than one, again, I'm being real with y'all. Each time he's put a mirror up to myself and each time I've had to repent. And in my repentance now have put controls in place to manage that because it's easy to get sidetracked in this world, in this business world. It's easy. And so we have to put boundaries in place to make sure that our ambition is managed well and stewarded well, because it's a gift. My ability to desire whatever and go after it and see it through, it's a gift. God gave me that, but I can't use that to advance my own selfish desires or to be an asset to the enemy. I need to steward that and keep it submitted and crucified so that I could still be honorable in the Lord's sight. So when I get off, I have to repent and I have to change course and I have to put controls in place so I don't get off again. And so for me, over the course of the years, I've seen certain things like, okay, this triggers me to be more susceptible to be selfish. So I need to put this in place so that I could temper that. Okay, these things, they keep me in this pure place. So I need to do more of that. And I thank God that, again, he's kept me in my bad decisions. He's forgiven me for my bad decisions. But then he's also given me wisdom 
on how to keep myself from making bad decisions and so much wisdom that I could even communicate it to you guys so you don't have to operate intentionally or unintentionally from a selfish, ambitious place. So let's talk about those boundaries. Shout out to those who hung out with me on YouTube because this came directly from that live. Let's talk about the specific boundaries to put in place on your entrepreneurship journey so that you can work from a place and build from a place of contentment and pure ambition and not have it perverted and turn selfish. The first boundary that you need to put in place is that you always prioritize godliness. Remember in 1 Timothy 6, 6 through 11, the first verse, it says, but godliness with contentment is great gain. The definition of godliness is that godliness refers to a profound respect, reverence, and devotion to God. It is an attitude and a lifestyle that reflects one's relationship with God that is characterized Because, hey, it's not just what you say, but it's characterized by a deep commitment to live according to his will. The Greek word for godliness is eusebia. So it combines you, which means well and good. And the second part that I'm not even going to butcher, it means to revere or worship. So it literally means well worship or good reverence. So it implies a life that is lived in a manner that is pleasing to God. In the word, godliness is often associated with a life of holiness, righteousness, and moral integrity. It goes beyond mere external religious observance. So it it goes beyond you just going to church, but it encompasses a heart and a mind that is fully devoted to God. In the New Testament, godliness is seen as an essential quality for us. So it reflects that transformation that occurs when we are aligned with God's character and purpose. Godliness manifests in a life of worship, prayer, obedience to God's commands, and moral purity. It involves both internal an internal attitude of reverence and outward actions that demonstrate your commitment to God. So it's not just about how many times you could go to church, how, many, how much you can be involved in Christian activities, but is your mind, is your heart, Are your actions focused on a life of devotion to the Lord? Does your character reflect the God that you believe in? Do you live a life that is pleasing in his sight? So prioritizing godliness is the biggest boundary, because if you do that, then the Lord will steer you back. Every selfish decision that I've made in ambition is because I got lax on some stuff. Because instead of keeping to my devotion and study time, I let myself get busy. And in that busyness of doing the work of the Lord, it took away from me being in that secret place. And so then my life and my obligations were louder than the voice of the Holy Spirit. And that's a dangerous place to be. And if you've been listening to this show long enough, you know, I'm a systems person. So for me, I know symptoms that happen that are an indicator that I am not in the secret place enough. One of those is anxiety. So if I find myself a bit more stressed and anxious, that is an indicator that I need to retreat to the secret place. And so in me, in this kind of veering into this selfish ambition, with that came anxiety. I didn't have contentment or peace because I wouldn't, my mind wasn't fixed on God. It was fixed on circumstances. And so when I noticed that about myself, I'm like, okay, hold on, red flag. Let me get back. And then as I got back to praying and fasting and in that secret place, the Lord began to show me where I was getting things wrong. I had to repent and I had to turn back and do things differently. And just so that I'm clear, because this show goes out to a lot of folks. And I am talking about ways that I've made decisions. The decisions that I've made in selfish ambition are decisions like I put out a program that I need to put out or I put something on sale that I know wasn't the best decision for money raising purposes and not necessarily because it was in alignment with what the Lord is showing me. I have not made any decisions that are detrimental to God's people or compromise my integrity in any type of way. I just want to make sure we're clear on that. <laughs> okay. 
these selfish decisions I've made are not at that level, but I need to learn those lessons even at this level so I don't get to that level. How many people we know that are so far gone because they didn't take heed to the Lord in these smaller moments? So I, I had to say that because I don't need nobody trying to take this narrative and run with it to try to create something that ain't there. No, this ain't that. She is integrous, period. And my name is Clean. <laughs> but back to the boundary. We have to always prioritize godliness. We can't get lax. Those of you who are in that place where you have no choice but to be in a secret place, you have no choice but to be on your face, you have no choice but to cry out and to be in your word because you're so desperate for the Lord right now because of circumstances, don't lose that once those circumstances change. Don't stop being on your face for the Lord and his provisions just because you start making money. Don't be um, lax in your prayer time and in all of that because life is getting business, busy and business is taking off. No, the, the way that the Lord is grooming you and he is teaching you in this season, it is for a reason. The suffering that you're going through in this season is for a reason. Part of it is to build your character, is to prune you, is to mold you into who he saw before he formed you in your mother's womb. Part of it is that. But there are also strategies here. So for those of you who are in that place of that in-between, that wilderness season as we've branded it, make sure that you are journaling, that you're taking notes, that you're writing down what the Lord has you doing here. Because there are these same acts, you're going to have to continue that on. Even when circumstances are okay, that's how you get to that point of contentment. I had a rough year and a half in business financially. I started a new business. I was figuring that out. I had a baby in the midst of all of this, which means that I was paying for the other businesses, which made my business a bit tight while I was just trying to figure everything out. I had to do layoffs. I had to do all of these things while I was trying to figure things out. I had to get uh, strategic with the budget and all of this stuff. But now as things are going well, as God is continuing to grow and elevate both of my businesses, I ain't stopped being cheap. <laughs> that cheapness was developed from a place of necessity at one point, but it's still here. I was fussing at my husband this morning, which is funny how the, the uh, tides have turned. My husband's an accountant and he's very cheap. I like nice things and I was a lot more, I, I was the more of a spender before. And so now I'm like, hey, you don't order Uber Eats way too many times. And I'm like, I really got some nerve. Who am I? Who is she? <laughs> but the Lord developed that in me in a season where things were tight. But now that things are not as tight as they were before, I, it's not for me to go back and start being a super spender again. No, I need to still maintain those boundaries and those lessons that the Lord has taught me. So the same for you, whatever process he has you in, whatever season it is, there are specific things that the Lord is teaching you in this season that you have to maintain for the next. And outside of those specifics, there are general things that we all need to be doing. We need to have an active prayer life. We need to be studying the word. This is why I created the Bible on Business Dashboard, because don't just take my word for these things. Go and study the word for yourself. We have to be studying the word. We have to create a lifestyle to where we're sensitive to the spirit. These things are applicable no matter what season you are. We have to keep our minds and our hearts Focus, devoted, and committed to the Lord, to his commands, to his way of living, period. You cannot deviate from that in this entrepreneurship journey. You can't. We can't think so highly of ourselves to where we think that we're too good to fall off. We're too good to get swept up in this business world. No, we have to have these controls in place. So that's the first boundary. Always prioritize godliness. The second boundary that we have to place to maintain that contentment is to guard against greed and covetousness. Covetousness is a strong, often unhealthy desire for something that belongs to someone else. 
It goes beyond mere admiration or wanting something similar. It involves an intense longing for what another person possesses, whether it be their marital goods, relationships, status, business success, followers, views, podcasts, etc., or even their spiritual blessings. Covetousness is closely tied to greed and envy, and it reflects a heart that is dissatisfied with what one has, leading to a focus on acquiring more, often at the expense of others or one's spiritual integrity. In the Old Testament, we see this concept in the Ten Commandments, particularly in Exodus 20 and 17, which says, you shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife or his male or female servant, his ox or donkey or anything that belongs to your neighbor. So here, chamad, which is the Hebrew word for covet, refers to a strong desire or craving for something that is not rightfully yours, which leads to discontentment and potentially sinful actions. Now, in the New Testament, covet is translated in the Greek as pleonexia. So it is translated as covetousness or greed. It literally means the desire to have more. And it is frequently condemned as a form of idolatry because it places material or worldly desires above the love and trust in God. Jesus warned against this in Luke 12, 15, saying, Take care and be on your guard for one's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. This highlights the spiritual danger of covetousness as it can lead a person away from reliance on God and toward a life dominated by materialism. So this is a whole point in and of itself, because in this business world, that temptation for greed, for more money, for more material things, for the bigger and more and more and more, it never ends. That temptation is always going to be there. And we don't want to give into it. We don't want to be like the parable of the rich fool that's highlighted in Luke 12, 13 through 21. We don't want that. We want to be content like Paul. And I believe one of the ways that you can guard against this is generosity. One of the wealthiest people in the Bible is Abraham. And I believe he is a great example of having wealth but not allowing that wealth to push him into greed or selfish ambition. Abraham always acknowledged God's blessings. In Genesis 14, 19 through 20, after a victory in battle, Abraham acknowledged God's role in his success by giving a tenth of everything to the king of the time. So because he tithed, he was already letting things be known like this wealth is a source from the Lord. If you go to Genesis 18, 1 through 8, Abraham used his wealth to be generous and provide hospitality for others. So he provided this lavish meal for the three visitors. So this is just another example of generosity and hospitality and and using that to show God's love and not allow your wealth to puff you up. There's so many examples for Abraham's life and actually in the Bible on business dashboard for today's episode, I'm going to give you some places to study Abraham in particular so that you can see him as a biblical example of someone who was wealthy, but didn't fall into selfish ambition. He, I believe, is a great case study on guarding yourself from greed and covetousness. And I'm I'm actually going to include just a few other examples of people who did and didn't get it right. So you could study their stories as well. So make sure you download the Bible on Business dashboard and I'll make sure that's there for today's episode. The third boundary that you could put in place is don't make your business your entire life. So many people find their identity in entrepreneurship. Something that helps me personally stay grounded and not get caught up in anything is spending a ton of time with my family and my loved ones. I went to the spa this week with a couple of friends and I was telling them like, I'm I'm chill, y'all. I don't try to show, I'm not super outwardly emotional, period. But I was just so overwhelmed with gratitude. And I kept telling them, I was like, man, I'm just so grateful. It's a Wednesday in the middle of the day. There are people at work right now hating their jobs. There are people that's going to be sitting in traffic on their way home. There are people who are stressed 
for so many different things. And the Lord saw fit to have us as young 20, early 30 somethings to just be here at the spa in the middle of the day. Like what is, whose life is this? Like it just felt so good, not because of any possession, but just that experience. And that God loves us so much that he allowed us to have that experience. Right now, the way my schedule is set up, I only work in my business two days a week, two hours, excuse me, a day and not even every day. So I work generally from like six to eight throughout the week. And that's it. The rest of my time is spent tending to my family, my home. I have the freedom of my time to be able to go and pick up my godsons or go and if if a family member needs me. So one of my family members was going through something recently and I pulled up on her. I ordered breakfast. I pulled up like, hey, what's going on? I know you're going through some things. How are you? Let's talk about it. But I'm able to show up and be there for the people that I love. My sister and I, I think I shared this. Um, I didn't give specifics, but the reason why I had to post a throwback episode, my sister recently had a heart procedure. And I dropped everything and hightailed it to Richmond to be in the hospital with her. Even when I was at home, I'm on her chart seeing what she got going on. I'm able to pray for her, to show up for her and do the same for those that God has blessed me with in my life. I have friends where um, one of my friends that I walk with where she, when we're having conversations, a lot of times the Lord will give me things to share with her, but I'm able to disciple her in real time. I'm able to disciple family members in real time. So yeah, business is wonderful. I'm ambitious and I do want to accomplish things in business, but it's not everything. And for me, by me practicing being present in other places and by business not being my whole life, because at one point it was, like my before I had kids and before I got married, it was like number one. And to be fair, it I wanted it that way for that time so that I could live like this now. So an element of that was intentional. But the lesson for that, though, still is business just can't be everything. So by business not taking up my whole world and me being able to be present in the allowing the Lord to use me in the other areas of my life, it is a lot more easy to be content because, you know, what matters more than me being a millionaire, seeing my family in glory. You know, what matters more to me than any type of accolade or what I could say I accomplished in business, my children knowing the Lord. And knowing them and wanting to know him and serve them for themselves, that matters more. What matters more to me than any award I could get for this podcast or whatever is the fact that my husband and I are still in love with each other and can enjoy each other and not have to to be anything for anybody else. But we can just be who the Lord created us to be for each other. All of this stuff matters so much more. And so when you focus on that, it's a lot easier to be content. When you know that, hey, if the bank take this house and they take everything that I own and all I'm left with is me my fa- and my family, I am wealthy. That perspective is necessary on this journey because then the enemy can't dangle some foolishness in your face in the form of material possessions and you bite. But making business uh, or not making business everything allows you to stay in the place of gratitude that you need to be in. And the last boundary that I want to tell you is check your heart regularly. I'm someone who believes that your reactions reveal a lot about the state of your heart. If you are triggered by somebody else's success, then that is a red flag that you could potentially be flirting with covetousness and you need to take that to the Lord. So some of you, you're praying for the Lord to help you deal with comparison or you're seeking advice on how to handle comparison in business, but that's not the prayer. The prayer is, God, the fact that I am comparing is highlighting some discontentment in my heart. And I know that this discontentment is making me spiritually vulnerable. So I need to bring this to you so we can work this out and you can heal me and make me whole and deal with this area in me. And it's not to bring shame 
or to make you feel bad, but let your reactions reveal something about yourself so that you can take it back to the father. I remember one time I was doing something at the studio and um, somebody came in. I don't know if it was a tour or something. I don't remember. But they were just like, oh my gosh, this place is so beautiful. I love this. Like, how did you do this? I want to do something like this one day. They were just in awe and so in love with the space. And I was eating it up. (laughs) I was eating it up, feeling real good, chest poked out. And when I noticed my reaction and my disposition to it, when they left, I said, Lord, I'm giving this to you right now. And I went into one of the rooms we have in the studio. I want to say like the podcast studio. I like locked the door so can't nobody come in. I went into the podcast studio and I prayed. I said, I, I to myself, uh-uh, this ain't going to your head. Crucify it. Put that chest back in and get on your face. You know that everybody may think that this is whatever from the outside looking in, but you know the blood, sweat, and tears. You think about that. You think about how the Lord has kept you. You think about how the Lord has kept this business. You think about how the Lord has shown up and provided. Don't sit here and start feeling yourself because of what these people are saying. And I sat there and I cried before the Lord and I prayed and I prayed and I prayed. And then the next time that happened, because it happens every time somebody comes in the space, because the studio is a genuinely beautiful space that is filled with the Holy Spirit. So everybody comes in and talks about how such a peaceful environment it is. And I just smile because I am smiling not with my chest poked out, but I'm smiling because I know they feel the presence of the Lord. And I'm smiling because I know what the Lord is doing and how he's going to continue to move. And I'm grateful. But if I would have reacted differently, I would have had to be right back on my face or fasting to really kill that part of my heart to where pride wanted to creep in. So as you navigate your entrepreneurship journey, pay attention to how you react. The Bible says that out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Pay attention to what you say. What do you say that you're not necessarily thinking about that could indicate something in your heart that needs to be surrendered to the Lord? Pay attention. Because those regular heart checks are going to be necessary for this walk. And you're, and the way that you're going to make sure that you're building your business from a place of godliness and contentment is by making sure that those guardrails are up to send you back anytime you might veer off. So let's do a quick recap of these boundaries. Number one, always prioritize godliness. Number two, guard against greed and covetousness. And an idea for how you do that is um, practicing generosity. And then I'm going to give you some people to study in the Bible. Number three, don't make your business your entire life. And number four, check your heart regularly. So that's it for another episode of the Blessed and Bossed Up podcast. Remember, the Bible on Business dashboard is available now for free at the link in the show notes. I let this episode be longer because one, I wanted to get a bit more thorough in some ways and some stuff we just can't talk about in 20 to 30 minutes. Let me know if you guys like these longer episodes because I purposely went into more detail than I might that I might not have trying to keep to like that 30 minute time frame. So let me know if you enjoyed this again. I love you guys. Thank you so much for listening to another episode of the blessed and bossed up podcast. And I'll see you in the next one.